Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Chris Herbert, the Managing Director of the Joint Center for Housing Studies, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the release of this year's Improving America's Housing Report. This is one of our signature reports we've been doing for more than two and a half decades now. This year's report chronicles the tumultuous events in the Ramali market over the last two years, with spending soaring as homes became the center of living, working, studying, and playing, and now cooling it rapidly in response to the Federal Reserve's moves to slow inflation. But as the report documents, there's still a significant need to invest in America's homes, both to maintain what is now the oldest housing stock on record, but also to respond to the need to improve energy efficiency, to respond to increasing natural disasters, and to adapt homes to an aging population. We're going to kick things off with a brief presentation of key findings by my colleague, Abby Will, a senior research associate and associate project director of the Remodeling Futures Program at the center. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Abby Carlos Martin, who directs the program, and Sophia Wadeen, a research analyst here, who all work very hard on preparing this year's report. After Abby's presentation, we'll welcome our panel to discuss the implication of this year's findings for the modeling market in the US. Before we get started, I'd like to thank ABC Supply for their financial support for the, for the production of this year's report. ABC has been a key sponsor of the last three, three reports, and we are grateful for their continued support. We're also grateful to the members of the Center's Remodeling Futures Steering Committee who help inform and fund our work on this important housing sector. Now, I'll turn it over to Abby to share findings on this year's report. Abby, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Chris. Share my screen here. I'm so pleased to be here today to share some of the key themes and highlights from our report with uh, all of you who are joining us. So let me just start right here with our estimates of the total market size for residential remodeling. The pandemic sparked massive investment in home improvements and maintenance, lifting the market to new heights. Between 2019 and 2021, spending on improvements and repairs to owner-occupied and rental properties grew fully 23% from $404 billion to $495 billion. And that's an annual pace of growth of about 11%. And we've estimated that spending grew another 15% in 2022 to $567 billion. And this phenomenal growth was driven by a variety of factors like the widespread adoption of working from home, the spectacular growth that we've seen in, in home equity and savings over, over this period, as well as the continued aging of the housing stock that Chris mentioned. Half of all owner-occupied homes in the U.S. are older than 40 uh, years today. And the surge in spending is expected to slow this year, given the many headwinds uh, that the market is facing, but we're still expecting a little bit of growth here, about 2.5% in 2023. So with the continued aging of our homes, replacement projects have become the dominant share of home improvement spending. So projects like roofing, HVAC, flooring, windows and doors, they make up nearly half of all homeowner improvement expenditures today. And this increased focus on more need to do projects that typically can't be deferred, at least not, not um, permanently, it's very different from the last remodeling boom back in the mid 2000s, when about equal shares of spending right around 40% were for replacements and discretionary projects, you know, the kitchen and bath remodels, the room additions, the types of projects that owners love to do, but they don't need to do. Even with that enormous boom in activity over the last uh, few years here, many homes remain in need of critical replacements and, and basic repairs. So in 2021, about 3 million homeowners and 4 million renters were living in inadequate homes with structural deficiencies, uh, inoperable or unsafe systems such as heating, plumbing, electrical, or water. Nearly one in five homeowners reported spending nothing for home improvements or repairs in 2021, and another 15% spent less than $500. And given their limited resources, lower income owners were much more likely to report uh, little or no spending to improve or ma maintain their homes. But as a group, these homeowners are an important segment of the market. They contribute about 10% of national spending each year. And when lower income owners do invest in their homes for those typically um, need to do projects, that spending represents a significant share of their incomes, um, fully 20% for owners in the lowest income quintile. 
and their ability to maintain their typically older, more affordable homes, it's critical not only for their own well-being, but also for the preservation of our aging housing stock. So at the same time, what we know about the current state of much of the existing housing stock is that it will require significantly more investment in home retrofits to meet the growing challenges for energy efficiency, for disaster resilience, and for accessibility. You know, here we see that over the past uh, decade, homeowner spending on energy related improvement projects, roofing, siding, windows and doors, HVAC insulation, all projects with the potential to improve home energy performance, um, it's accounted for a third or more of total home improvement spending in the US. You know, whether to simply replace worn components or reduce energy bills, these projects are often necessary expenditures that contribute to basic adequacy. And much of that increase in, in energy-related improvement spending is also due to the aging of the housing stock. 19% uh, of homeowners living in homes built before 1940 reported doing one or more energy efficiency improvements in 2020 or 2021, and that's nearly twice the share of owners living in newer homes built since 2000. Homeowner spending to restore damaged homes has also become a bigger part of the home improvement market with the increasing number and the increasing strength of disasters. Um, according to NOAA, uh, that's in the kind of uh, background orange uh, color there, the number of billion dollar disasters in the US adjusted for inflation over time that occurred annually grew from fewer than 10 before 2008 to 20 or more billion dollar disasters in both 2020 and 2021. And then shown on a, on a three-year rolling basis in the bars here, real aggregate expenditures for disaster repairs to owner-occupied homes reached $20 billion in 2021, up from average annual spending of $17 billion during the 2010s and well above the $12 billion uh, average annually in the 2000s. And then disaster repairs as a share of national improvement spending also trended upward from an average of about 5.4% between 2002 and 2011 to 6.9% uh, over the, this last decade. Remodeling activity faces serious challenges in, in the near term, right, including, um, you know, the rising cost of projects and financing, declining home prices and sales, labor and supply constraints, you know, the risk of, of recession this year. But the market is much more diversified today than during the last boom with that greater focus on more need to do replacement and repair projects and much less reliant on kind of the high spending uh, homeowners doing big ticket discretionary work. And the opportunities for longer term growth are numerous. Record levels of home equity, the rise of, of remote work that seems to be here to stay to some degree, the continued aging of our already old homes, growing activity among owners of color, as well as the sheer number of millennials that have kind of yet to reach those prime ages for first time home buying and remodeling, that all points to continued strength in remodeling. And then modifying our homes for accessibility and safely aging in place, retrofitting our homes to be more resilient to increase disaster activity, and the boosts that we're expecting to see from, from new uh, federal incentives for energy efficiency and for electrification are all increasingly necessary areas of opportunity for future investment in home remodeling. And with that, I'll uh, turn things over to Jane Jilski, Principal Analytical Lead at Google, who will moderate our discussion about the report today. Jane, the floor is now yours. You're on, Jane, you're on mute. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Abby. Uh, before we dig into the report, I would like to take a moment and introduce our panelists. So I'll have each of them turn their cameras on. Please note that bios for each panelist are available on their center's website. And I also wanna mention that folks can join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag Harvard Housing Report. First with us today is Carlos Martin. He's the project director of the Remodeling Futures program at the center and one of the lead authors of this new report. We're also happy to have Ruth Ann Norton with us. Ruth Ann is president and CEO of the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. 
Jessica Granderson is the Interim Director of the Building Technology and Urban Systems Division at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And finally, we have Keith Rosales, who is President and CEO of ABC Supply. Thank you all of you. Uh, so let's get into the report. The big story is, of course, the unprecedented amount of remodeling activity that's been happening during the pandemic, estimated to be around $567 billion in 2022. So even with the slowdown that's happening right now, this has been a crazy time for the remodeling market. So Carlos, I'd like to start with you. What drove this unprecedented growth? Yeah, I mean, first off, you're absolutely right. I mean, in real terms, spending just in the past, uh, during the pandemic surpassed the peak levels that we saw This is in the back previous boom in the mid 2000s. Um, so this is unprecedented time. And growth in the last few years really held true for all segments of homeowners and all um, kinds of projects. And when I say segments of owners, it's both homeowners who live in their homes and um, so owner-occupied properties as well as rental properties. Um, so both grew um, and the types of projects, so repairs and improvements both grew. And important to remember that when we say improvements, we mean the remodels, the additions, the replacements and other activities that are meant to increase the value of the home and the, the housing stock separate from things just to maintain the repair and maintenance kind of cost. So in just those improvements, uh, improvements improvements rose 25 percent and that was twice as fast as the repair expenditures over the over that period between 2019 and 2021 and in that improvement market homeowner improvements the owner occupied homes made up two-thirds of all that spending so a lot of the so just looking at that that was a huge segment of the population so a lot of that growth was due to the fact that owners were simply spending more on average per project they went as a report now it's one from thirty three hundred um dollars uh, to four thousand dollars on average project but there was also a bigger number of people doing home improvement projects and this range across income levels there is a deconcentration of wealthier people doing a lot of the improvement projects there were about 2.3 million more households doing improvements in 2021 than there were in 2019 and remember 2019 was already a hefty number so the short answer to your question comes from the fact, basic facts right that the, the number of homeowners were, uh, doing improvements increased and how much they were spending on each of those projects increased but the decisions that caused those folks to improve their homes and to spend more on, on when, when they did uh, do those improvements is a question that we need to ask. What resources were they able to access um, to be able to do that? And what was it about the homes themselves that required some kind of improvement or um, repair? Those are the underlying questions I think that this report tries to get at and that I'm looking forward to hearing my fellow panelists' thoughts on. Yes, that's uh, perfect. So you mentioned the access to resources. So obviously, even though we had a huge number of homeowners tackling these improvement and repair projects during the pandemic, many homeowners did not. So Ruthann, I would love to hear from you and hear your thoughts on what this report says about the challenges for households who likely because they couldn't afford to did not undertake projects like these in the recent years. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jane, and congratulations on, I thought, was such an amazing and important report that will serve as a great resource for us. What are lower income homeowners and those living in lower income rental housing actually faced in this time is less access to government programs because of the pandemic that would have helped support renovation, repair for unhealthy housing and older aging housing stock, but the competition for owners, the inflation, occurring with that at the same time most of our lower income homeowners and occupants are living in houses with such a greater energy burden that their resources are dwindling with with a growing income divide with an aging population with an energy burden and greater challenges that you get in that older housing stock that kind of hit a crescendo but most of the, while government spending was moving forward in many fronts, it was actually almost on hold entirely around those programs that would help housing upgrade benefits for seniors, uh, address unhealthy housing conditions, or even the, the work and energy efficiency. That said, I think we are about to turn a corner where the uh, sort of the private markets, if you will, look to be from looking at the report, maybe slowing a bit and where the contractor kind of growth may actually occur is in the low income 
uh, area because of the Inflation Reduction Act, the Jobs Act that's moving forward. There's certainly a growing need as we think about climate resiliency, but there's also an amazing opportunity, which I'll happily talk about throughout this, that will come in our ability to address core issues of roofing and uh, HVAC and window replacement, the core infrastructure work that's needed. And that infrastructure work that is also needed for the aging population, who certainly post pandemic has little interest in going into assisted living into skilled nursing facilities, which took a hit in and of itself and is driving a greater desire for age in place. And so I think we're gonna see uh, the opportunity in front of us to close that eight to one gap on equity that gets built in this market, in the housing market, but between black and brown communities and white communities, that we have an opportunity to bring a new sense of investment and a way to do it in a whole house approach, which we'll talk about, that will, I think, give contractors greater faith to work in the lower income communities, knowing that they will have a consistent set of work where they're able to get paid uh, better through uh, government assisted programs. And it will help to drive uh, that equity and market uh, so that we will improve the, the plight and our moral compass in a way on the of low income housing and the condition of low income housing in America. Thank you, Ruth Ann. Uh, I think for a lot of us and um, many people tuning into this call, when we think about home remodeling, we're often picturing new kitchens, new bathrooms, room additions, but this report really highlights the growing market for energy related improvements. So Jessica, I would love to hear from you because you've been in the building energy world for some time now. So you probably have some insights as to what we learned during the Recovery Act 15 years ago. Uh, is residential technology, especially for existing homes in a different place today? Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanna echo uh, Ruth Sands. congratulations to our colleagues at the center for this tremendous report. Um, we definitely saw, you know, in, in terms of the Recovery Act, um, how important federal investments are um, in moving technology uptake and also those improvements that we're so focused on in today's discussion. I mean, we saw some uh, over 15 million smart meters deployed under the Recovery Act, a million homes weatherized. And I think with the Inflation Reduction Act, we expect even more impact. And that's um, particularly when we consider how we're going to address the need in those low income homes, right? That's been so effectively highlighted um, in this work. Uh, secondly, in terms of really driving um, climate ready measures like electrification. Uh, so we could kind of look at the Recovery Act as one phase or one stage as in this continuing uh, evolution towards higher home performance. And while the Recovery Act, I think, was really mo mostly effective in our new construction, um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, we're really uh, looking to existing homes and getting there through retrofit programs, tax credits, and rebates. And, you know, one, I guess the thing that's so compelling to me about where we're at today is like we know that the home energy upgrades can be pretty hard, a pretty hard sell. Um, and when we have those energy related aspects of remodeling activity only increasing, I mean, I was, that was delighted to see that that was like a third of the improvements as documented in the report. So when we have the capacity to pair those with the IRA incentives, we can move beyond the kind of business as usual practices. So that really means that our um, HVAC and water heater replacements, we don't need to just go to base efficiency gas units. We can move the high efficiency electric heat pumps. We can really amplify our investments in uh, the, the less glamorous uh, interventions like insulation and air sealing that are going to bring us uh, much deeper and tremendous benefits. Uh, so these are some of the uh, key ways that I think we're really in a, a markedly different place now than we were 15 years ago. Thank you. Uh, so 
totally agree. Energy related improvements was a major focus in this report, but another area of opportunity for future investment that we're really diving into here is a disaster repair and mitigation and accessibility for aging in place. Keith, I would love to hear from you. What are you seeing within your product categories across these areas? Yeah, uh, Keith Rosales, just for those that don't know, ABC Supply, our core business is roofing, siding, windows, gutters, drywall, uh, and ceilings. So uh, I don't know that I can speak specifically to aging in place, except what our customers see in the marketplace, so the wider doors, you know, things like that. But but for us, when you talk about, you know, solar and energy is very seems to be the big sort of aha but with respect to disaster mitigation, I mean, there's no question that we have a, a changing climate. And what you're seeing in our world is the products are changing. So you've got, you've got uh, sort of this upscaling to class three and class four. So if there's hail damage, you see people putting roofs on that can withstand that. You're seeing different adhesives and wind uplifts. So, you know, so when there is a storm, the house withstands the storm because, you know, here, here's, the, here's the reality. If the roof leaks, the rest of the house has a disaster. So if you can save the roof in many, many cases, you can save most of the house and all of that, all of that expense internally. So, so I think you know, what you're seeing on the manufacturing side is, is a trying a movement of products that can help mitigate that. You know, obviously government has a strong role here too with proper codes, you know, making sure that you can that you, Florida is a great example. Newer homes are way, way better able to withstand that. Uh, so that's probably the biggest thing that we're seeing there. Now, another thing that may or may not sort of hit this, it's probably not in this remodeling report. I will tell you what we are seeing on our, in our drywall division. Uh, there is going to be eventually a big issue with noise pollution because the current fad and trend is to these, all these big open ceilings and these big sort of airy warehouse spaces. And I believe what you'll see with an aging population that's going to become an area of opportunity. And I, I think every one of us has been in a restaurant where we can't even hear the person across from us talking. So, so what you're going to see is how do we create products and how do we put these in place that, that helps sort of muffle that sound in that environment. So th those are probably the two areas that, that I think would be very interesting to, to, to look at. So uh, that's what Thank I've got. You. No, that's great. Very insightful. Definitely uh, some factors there I hadn't considered. Um, one thing I'd, I'd like to pivot a little bit, uh, so many of us on the call and across the world, we're still processing the changes that this pandemic brought in terms of our personal lives. And I think this report does a really nice job of trying to make sense of those impacts, particularly in the world of home remodeling. So the big question is, is how much of the pandemic impacts are going to continue over the longer term? Um, or if some of these are persistent changes. So Carlos, I'd love to hear from you are we seeing a different a changed remodeling industry uh, yeah i uh, just uh, uh playing off of the keith's comment i mean certainly so much so many of us were especially starting in march 2020 we're at homes we're with our families more than we may have wanted to in some cases maybe we didn't want to hear what they were saying in the same room <laughs> um but I mean, there are broader trends and i think it's great i mean these three panelists co-panelists um have talked about three core issues that I think have uh, played out over the pandemic that we may be seeing in the future. So let me break these down a little bit. So one was the issue of like the social and behavioral decisions to make repairs to your home or make changes to your home. The other was financial resources to be able to do it. And the third was what the, the reality is of your home, the physical quality of the homes and um, requiring some kind of either repair or some improvement. So let's break those down even further. So on the decision side, one of the things we saw during the pandemic was this belief that people were moving at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, the reality is we the, the overall trend has been uh, declined in household mobility over the last four decades. So we I don't expect some of the, that early surge that occurred at the beginning of the pandemic in terms of people moving. Um, there are great reports, and I encourage you to look at um, my colleague's work at the Joint Center for Housing Studies, Bridget Frost, who has been tracking mobility patterns in the U.S. that Basically, there was that early surge and there was a surge in specific places, for example, from cities to suburbs or to ex-urban areas, but that has pretty much declined. So we don't expect that to continue. Um, the other big social um, uh, pattern that we saw, behavioral pattern, was working from home. And that we definitely see a lot of that to be entrenched. Certainly, 
during the pandemic that tripled the rates of people working from home. Um, um, and even with the re re more recent return to the office in, in a, in a quasi post pandemic world, we expect many people to continue holding, being able to be in certain occupations that would allow them to continue to work from home at least part time. So those are a lot of those are contributing to some of the changes in functions and uses in the homes that we saw and we expect some of that to continue um, moving forward. So that was on decision making on resources who has the money to be able to do certain things. So um, remember, uh, there was a, a lot of conversation about the personal saving rate that massively grew at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, that subsequently, pretty soon after that, dropped way back down to, to below pre-pandemic levels. So the sa because savings rates are back down, we um, don't expect that sort of boost in res resurgence of individual um, resources to be able to um, tap into um, to be able to do repairs. But what we do see is the bigger, broader trend about home equity. And that is still going to continue. We've had a little bit of a, lane, a leveling off in the last a couple of quarters in terms of the value of um, um, home equity in aggregate. But the reality is homes continue, home values continue to appreciate. Why? Because the fundamentals are still there in the housing market. We don't have enough housing. So people's individual homes are um, the values are, have appreciated and people, um, uh, uh, the need to be able to uh, tap into that kind of financing and the value of your home is still going to be a valuable resource input into people's decisions to make repairs or improvements. And then the homes themselves. Abby brought this home point home. Um, and then we want to keep reminding people that uh, our, the average, the median age of housing in this country is getting older. We're past 40 years now. Um, we're getting we're becoming an older country, not just in terms of our individual age, and I say that myself personally, <laughs> but also the quality of our homes. And this is true even in, if you look back in the last boom era, um, the last boom which in which homes were built to higher standards and other um, relationship to Keith and Jessica's points about sort of the quality of the, re the regulations that we impose on um, homes. So in the big boom in the mid in the mid 2000s, the early to mid 2000s, um, a lot of those homes are reaching you know, their 20 year mark. And 20 year mark is when a lot of equipment, um, systems, materials start to use Chinua uh, uh paraphrase Chinua Echebe, things start falling apart. Um, so there's going to be sort of this additional, even with homes that are built at a higher standard, higher quality, higher contemporary um, level of rigor, there's still going to be a need for um, improvements in the long term. So those, so all of those three factors sort of contributing together suggest that there's still going to be some need for attention. Yeah, I've been working closely with the center for several years now, and that aging housing stock is definitely a common thread that connects all of our research. So I'd love to dig into that a little bit more. I think this is particularly interesting. Uh, it plays out differently across the other issues that we've been discussing. So for example, low-income households may not have the resources to make these changes to their home. Um, if they're renters, they might not have the right to. So Ruth Ann, do you have any thoughts on where we need to be going for this sector when we're thinking about our aging housing stock? Yeah, I, you know, I think I was listening to uh, the panel, right? And I think we have an opportunity in the low income communities and where we're especially hard hit in the Northeast and places around uh, areas like Detroit, less in the Sun Belt, but across the country, we have great disparities around home equity and intergenerational wealth transfer, right? For how, for the equity of housing, we have a, but we have an opportunity here around equity, around health and around helping to use home improvement as infrastructure to help lead climate change and resilience with low-income communities. It's an unprecedented opportunity that we have to do this, but there's some things that have to go along with that, right? And that includes some of the policy look. And what you've seen recently is in Pennsylvania, they've passed a very large uh, uh, piece of legislation the whole house approach, which is actually in part modeled on the green and healthy homes uh, work, where we're looking at the intersection of energy, health and safety, right? Addressing those longstanding intractable issues like lead paint, mold, mildew, moisture, roofing issues, along with climate, and being able to bring them together 
to upgrade electrical systems, upgrade uh, homes there, and to close this gap that people have not had access to resources in the marketplace as expensive as it's gotten, will now have that access, including more than $14,000 in rebates to really incentivize contractors to work in low-income communities. We have an opportunity to create jobs from low-income communities to bring and upskill workers to help us across the nation, across all sectors in what we need in contractor capacity to meet the moment. And I think that's going to be incredibly important. And then in places like Maryland, where I just finished the stint serving as the transition co-chair for Westmore on housing, we just passed a bill that is going to level the playing field around how we take public investments and ensure that home repair is going to low income communities at an unprecedented rate and, and really uh, leveling that playing field. So I think we still have issues of housing code enforcement that needs to be done equitably so that renters can capture the benefits of home repair dollars and, and, and incentivize landlords to move there. We have to take advantage of the moment to also address this issue of aging housing and aging residents. I'll claim I am probably the oldest person on this panel, so dear, near and dear to my heart, but we will save so much in dignity, in quality of life, and in the long-term costs for all of us uh, by making these investments, but it will take continue to take a policy look a really strong research look like this paper has provided us a base and the engagement in incentivizing the contractor base to focus on low-income communities to build that access affordability so we can move to equity. Got it. Um, Jessica, uh, as you mentioned before, just tying this in, tax credits, rebates for energy efficiency and electrification retrofits. Um, as our energy expert, what do industry folks, remodeling folks who are on this call and tuning, tuning in need to know today? Hmm. I think I want to amplify uh, and dovetail with some of Ruth Ann's comments. Um, first of all, but first of all, I'll just say thank goodness for those credits and rebates. Uh, we contractors that we work with, uh, you know, we know how much people love a deal. Um, we've already heard uh, deferment of work to 2023 just to get the bigger deal. Um, so Ruth Ann mentions the moment that's here. It's a big moment. Um, I guess I would like folks first to know that the um, opportunity in our homes from a climate perspective is extraordinary. Um, so our the largest emission reduction potential that we have in the built environment is in our homes. It's 60% uh, of the potential by 2030 and out year that goes up to the range of 70%. So uh, I'll also echo that these investments that we're making to get there uh, go so far beyond climate into all of the points around health, safety, and climate resilience and how they're intersecting as, as reflected in my colleagues' comments uh, this afternoon. Um, second, uh, the technology, like we, we can do this and we know how to do this. The technology already exists to obtain these very uh, massive benefits. So, you know, the playbook is, traditional home performance, the insulation, the air sealing, plus electrification, and uh, possibly uh, rooftop solar. Uh, the really, the only um, remaining kind of technical concerns are around how we're looking to manage uh, really the impacts on the grid as we aggressively electrify. Um, and that's where we're seeing a lot of innovation that can help some of the smart systems that were talked about in the report and digitization, uh, low power demand appliances, and also storage. Um, so, you know, technology is, is pretty much there. I think in addition to the policy landscape uh, that provides the overarching context, 
we really have um, a delivery innovation challenge. Uh, we need to make this stuff very easy. Um, the solar industry has given us a really good example and model. Look at how that's matured over time. Like it just goes for people. Um, so I think we're seeing some really terrific innovation out there by companies and organizations who are really looking at massive simplification, how we uh, guide homeowners through the process, how we connect folks with um, skilled contractor networks, uh, centralize the organization of those different rebates, and so on. Thank you. No, thank you. That's so much good information. Um, I would like to dig in a little bit, Keith. Um, there is so much uncertainty now with inflation, with rising interest rates, uh, possible recessions on the horizon. What are your thoughts on the market for home improvements and repairs? And, and how is that shaping up over the next few years, considering all this uncertainty? Yeah, I think the next, at least the next 18 months, I, I'm not, uh, it's going to be a little softer than 2022, but I'm not concerned in the sense of, I, I think we're going to have another 2008. Uh, so, so I'm not at all concerned with that. I agree with Carlos general conclusion, right? We couldn't go to, to, to Florida or Disney world. So we decided to fix our roof or fix our kitchen, right? That's sort of the COVID uh, thing. Part of part of my sort of optimism is this, you know, uh, and and I want to, you know, some might call it, you know, the supply chain issue was COVID, but I'll be honest with you, in, in much of building products, part of the issue was the weather. We had some very big choke points where we had the, the freeze in Texas caused it some key raw materials to be in short supply. So what you had is constrained supply. So there is still some demand out there that has been stretched out into 2023 that frankly, if we had adequate supply of products and we had adequate labor, we would have done all this work in 2022. So, so, so having a governor on demand is actually not necessarily a bad thing because it sort of, it, it pushes it out over time. And so you don't have this huge sort of boom bust mindset. And, and for, you know, in, in our space, uh, listen, I've been in the business 24 years, government incentives work, you know, way back in the day when they wanted to, to enter, they wanted you to get new windows. So for energy efficiency, and lo and behold, a bunch of windows got sold. Here's the problem in some cases. In many of those situations, you've just pulled demand forward. You haven't created new demand. So what, what we're talking about today, though, is if you're focusing on maybe low income that wouldn't have, you know, you, you're trying not to just pull it forward, you're trying to get incremental demand from that. And that's a, that's a delicate balance, right? It's really hard to sort of fine tune a rifle shot like that with a government policy, because we, we have seen for a fact, we sold a, a lot of windows and then it went dry for three years because it, for all intents and purposes, we, we, we took the demand from two years from now. The same thing with weather. If there's a storm in a particular part of the country, you're literally taking the next five years of roofing and you're, and you're doing it in six months or a year. So unless you have another storm, you're going to have a, a hole there. So, so I'm still very bullish. Uh, I, think, I think there was a shift forever. There, people's home is their castle again. Uh, and, I, and I believe people are willing to make the investments. I do believe, though, that uh, you know, the nice-to-haves will be less than the need to have. So, so, you know, if you have a big home equity, you're going to remodel your kitchen. Well, once you've remodeled your kitchen, you're 18 years away from remodeling it again, right? Uh, but also, as inflation makes it more and more expensive, you're going to have to make the trade-offs, right? Uh, so, so I think, I don't think we're going to see, you know, the supply constraints, I, you know, I put down here because I think you were asking, we're okay on supply right now for 2023. I think all of that is behind us. Uh, but, but I do think, now labor is going to come back to the forefront. People to actually do the work uh, is still is still a constraint uh, in, in our world. So I don't know if that answered your question. I hope it did. <laughs> no, it was, it was great. I think all those are, are really key points. So, you know, supply chain, labor availability, these were major issues during the pandemic, you know, despite our tremendous growth. But I would like to hear from Carlos. Can you um, add on to some of Keith's uh, comments here. What is happening here and what do we see happening with these challenges moving forward? Yeah, especially those specific ones that Keith has brought up. I'd like to add on to it. But I, I do want to say I'm enjoying this sort of back and forth on the idea of optimism at the like this this is a critical turning point as well as sort of the reality check 
that we're doing and how it plays out, not only in the capacity for certain households to have the financial resources to do things, but also like, what are we learning about their decision-making processes? I think that's ultimately what our Remodeling Futures program tries to do is like, how do we get into behind the veil of the data and the findings? What do we know about what people are, are, are trying to, um, um, are motivated by? Uh, at all price points, at all um, income levels, and at all um, uh, and in all geography. So, but let me get back to the reality check that you brought up, and that's the idea of like, the materials fluctuations. And certainly, in a lot of the um, product lines that Keith and ABC handle, um, there's a, a little more stability in the market. Um, but you know, we we did see wide wild fluctuation um, during the pandemic on a lot of other product lines. In particular, I'm thinking about the lumber, the uh, steel, and now we're at uh, Washington Post just put an article out today on concrete um, variations. And we all sort of in the industry, I'll recall the, the great garage door crisis of 2022, right? That nobody could find the garage doors anywhere in the country for a whole year. So there has been, there had been market material volatility well before the pandemic, right? Um, and there, but even though it was clearly on steroids during the early parts of the pandemic, um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, in many ways, we're not going to see that end anytime soon. I mean, Kith brought up a critical point, like the supply chains are inherently based on the ability to move things from one place to another. And if there is a major energy crisis or a major uh, um, um, environmental hazard that prevents people from moving, then that's keeping product from getting to market. Um, we live in a globalized construction product market, right? So we we're going to continue to see price changes due to global events like the Ukrainian war. Um, so I'm kind of intrigued about how when we a lot of the provisions in some of the IRA rebates and tax credits that we're talking about also have made in America requirements, um, which you know, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out on market material availability, especially in the product lines for the, the residential energy related retrofits that we want to see. So okay. that was that was on the material. I'm sorry. I'm gonna. I, I didn't. I spent so much time on that. I want to make keep sure going, I talk going. about work, workforce because um, that was the other issue that Keith brought up, and that is clearly a longer term trend. I mean, what we saw during the pandemic was, and this is true of the entire construction industry in this country as well as related um, um, installation uh, uh, occupations, was that there was a, a wider, um, a higher quit rate and a wider uh, a pool of job openings in home building and remodeling. And this is especially true in the sort of back office, sort of the sales and marketing um, occupations that were more likely to be able to transfer their skills to other industries altogether. Um, in the longer term, what worries me, and this preceded the pandemic, is a longer term dearth of skilled tradespeople. Um, which is a bigger concern in the remodeling industry. Um, Jessica pointed to this issue in terms of who's, a, who's able to understand the increasingly complex technologies. You know, I always say, you know, people think home building is, it, 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 people who aren't in the home, who have never built anything in their home, who haven't gone through a remodeling project, think that housing is, in, is easy compared to like major public works or major you know, commercial building. That's simply not true. It's just as complicated, especially with the kind of technologies that we're employing. So having that skilled traits um, uh, people uh, available to do these uh, to do these installations is going to be absolutely critical. I and mean, there have been experiments that a lot of them started pre-pandemic, but also certainly during the pandemic in recruitment and training. And this is especially true for women and racial groups that have been historically excluded from these occupations. Um, but these are gonna require longer-term solutions and those pilots that are going on now are gonna be longer-term solutions, right? We need the skill force now to be able to do some of the rebates and tax credit installations that we're talking about. That makes sense. And Carlos, I'm actually gonna stick with you a little bit longer. Something that we haven't really gotten to yet that the report highlights is uh, the changes around how homeowners are getting these projects done. And I think one factor was the, the shortage of labor and supply. But for example, we've seen phenomenal do-it-yourself growth. So DIY, those, those categories. And we saw the use of home equity to finance the larger projects. How are you seeing these trends continuing in the future? Yeah, that was that was sort of a, a, nice, a pleasant surprise to see all that DIY spending. Um, so in 2021, you could see this in the report, 44, 2021, 40 uh, DIY spending was 40% higher than it was two years before. So that's a big 
leap in DIY spending, right? And you compare that. So that was 44% for DIY. And for professional installation, that growth was about 22%. So it was significantly a higher growth rate. But that's a growth rate. When you compare, when you put it into context, DIY shares of total improvement spending only ticked up 2.5 percentage points to about 20%. And that, that was still well below historical highs in the mid 2000s during the last boom when DIY spending was about a quarter of the market. So the overall trend is actually less DIY and much more towards professional installation for a lot of reasons, um, including the fact that we were just talking about that so many of these technologies, so many, so much of this installation requires some skill level. And I may not have the money to pay for somebody and I may go to a local uh, supplier or distributor or a retail place and try to install it myself. The end result, I can tell you, if I do it, it's not going to be a pretty one. So a lot of people really are turning more towards professional in the overall trend. Um, so I would say I'd say it's important. One of the things that is great about our uh, biannual report is that we do track what happened in the last series, but we could also put in that broader historical context. Thank you. And that actually, let's uh, take that kind of one step further. So another factor here that we discussed, so you mentioned do it yourself, people, you know, attempting it either because they don't have the resources, but another factor that we discuss here is this complex web of municipal and charitable rehabilitation and repair programs. Um, there are also national programs like weatherization assistance. So Ruth Ann, um, what do you see the, as the role for these programs in the future and how can the, their implementation and their access be improved? I'll start with the last part. Uh, so the weatherization programs and our programs to transition housing off of carbon emitting uh, mechanicals right to a clean energy future um, gives us the opportunity to think more holistically about housing. So in the United States, in the weatherization assistance programs, there's about a 52% deferral rate because of lead paint, because of mold, mildew, and moisture, because of roofing and foundation issues. So to, to affect those programs and implement them at their highest level, we have to look holistically. So we have three major opportunities here. One is the improvement of the health of residents of all income levels, but especially the lower income communities who suffer more greatly from lead poisoning, from asthma, from injury, from their home. Right? And that improves economic pathways, it improves housing stability and the resilience of communities. We have the ability to have a major impact on climate. Jessica laid out the, the facts on that 60% uh, curve on moving forward the climate goals of governors across the country. And, 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 right? and we have the opportunity to create skilled jobs where we can get past the mismatch of people looking for jobs and jobs that are available, what this presents to us is that opportunity to upskill, to employ, and to help on the contractor capacity side of the supply of uh, home remodeling and renovation and continue to professionalize the work um, over time. So we have really massive opportunities as we do this. My biggest concern, right, is, is around whether we take the opportunity to actually implement and get these monies to the end beneficiaries, to the homes across the country. And we have to do the jobs work to do that. But in doing it, we can reach so many other goals that literally the remodeling community can become the leaders of improving health, climate, and resiliency of communities of all levels across the country. And I think that's where it is the I've, I've spent 30 years batting uh, back against the inequities in, in low-income housing, and but this is the opportunity. And I think in every challenge, um, we have to look at how do we get move it forward, and that's what allows us to do it. But we have to leverage these programs together. Thank you. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And I wonder, Jessica, um, from your perspective as an energy expert, there's this long chain of professionals that need to align for implementation of an energy retrofit program and to have those be successful. What do we know about household behaviors when it comes to making these type of energy improvements? Mm, long chain indeed. 
You know, I th one thing we know is that there's a, a tremendous amount of diversity in uh, like the values as well as some of the pressures that are driving household decision making. Um, I think we also know that things like um, replace on failure is a very common kind of um, action mode. And the dynamics that come up in that case, I actually went through, it's awful. I went through this just a couple of years ago myself, um, no hot water, right? And that just does not lead to um, the best choices. That tends to lead to a lot of like for like replacement. I was like devastated that I wasn't able to make the most efficient decision for my home given those uh, pressures. Um, We've heard this through line across the discussion today that safety, health, and resilience can be really strong motivators to piggyback our retrofit actions on. We need to keep that front and center. And, uh, um, and you know, as far as the behavioral side, I think there's um, there are some things we know, but there's actually a ton more to learn. Um, so this is indeed an area of active research for us at Berkeley Lab to really be able to uh, dig into a deeper level of nuance to understand how it is that we can really um, maximize those intervention points and, you know, kind of the everyday lived context of families going about their business when we want to also um, kind of align with whole home retrofits and upgrades. Thank you. So, you know, Keith, I, I'd like to turn to you for a moment. We've spent some time thinking about what the future of demand looks like in all these categories. Uh, if you had a crystal ball, could you tell us what you're seeing in your crystal ball for the future of the supply side of these types of improvements? Sure. Uh, well, I will say this. I think we're in a good point right now, good stasis. You know, the, the supply is probably sort of optimize without a huge spike in demand and vice versa. But but I think you'll see the manufacturers be a little bit slower with bringing supply online because, you know, it takes two or three years to build a plant, right? And so you're guessing what's the future demand going to be there. So they want to have a better feel for what they think down the road is going to look like. Uh, but for the most part, I think, I think we'll be okay in our standard products. I will say there's a handful of products that are just there's a product that, that goes into multifamily housing. It's called shaft wall. There is a perpetual shortage of shaft wall because it's hard to make. Uh, but it's almost like an orphan drug, right? You just you want to have enough to meet the demand, but you, you can't make the investment because you don't see the return on your investment if you're if you're running a business. So, but but I think I think the biggest shortage we're going to have is in skilled labor. Uh, Carlos is right. I mean, we have an aging out of a really talented skilled uh, labor force. Some of the things that our industry is doing, you know, in our space. So as an example, if, if the skilled labor is, is shrinking, now you are relying on less or I'll call it semi-skilled. So you're trying to make the products, you might make it more forgiving. So we have a bigger nailing hem. So if someone can swing a hammer, but they can't swing it very well, they've got a bigger landing area. On a commercial roof, you have, you, you simplify the pro the process so you just have one welded seam so you see some automation coming into that so you know absent you know uh immigration reform because uh, you know, the reality is this the people that love to work with their hands and are good at it generally are, are immigrants uh, my my grandparents were carpenters uh and we are aging out right now and i think the big shortage we will have is skilled labor and i think you know and and that's something that that requires industry, government, you know, people, everybody needs to line up to make that, to make a change there. And that's probably the sort of the, like social security used to be when I was a kid, that's the third rail of, of, of politics right now. So I don't, I don't have any, because, uh, because here's where the problem is. If there's a shortage of skilled labor, it just feeds the affordability crisis because they can, you know, they, they can demand higher wages. You know, Carlos, we talked about you know, our metal prices went up over 100%. They've come down 50%, right? So commodities like that can fluctuate and you can adjust for that. When labor goes up, it never goes down. So when you have a shortage of labor, those rates stay there forever. So a house that might've cost 290,000 $290, is gonna cost 400,000. Even if the, the products come back down, the lumber comes down, the roofing comes down, 
it's still the labor to put that in, that rate never comes down. Uh, so so, I, so that, that's an issue for us. Uh, so we have to figure out how to re-engineer the homes to put that affordability back. And, uh, but I'm, I'm bullish. I, I'm really bullish on, on, you know, we've got 80 million millennials. Uh, you know, we have a shortage of housing right now. The home is the castle again. Uh, but, I, but I think that you're going to see more, uh, more uh, shortages than you've ever had in the past because people are going to be tentative about increasing capacity. Uh, you know, as a distributor, what we did is we just we just brought on a lot more safety stock, right? So we just brought a ton more inventory in. So just in time became just in case, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean the manufacturer wants to make a, a huge investment in more capacity because once that capacity comes to, onto market, if the demand isn't there, that's not healthy either. So so I so I think we're I think we'll be good for the next few years. Uh, again. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to see us. I'd like to see us really figure out the labor equation. Obviously, if you can't find the labor, you simplify the process. Uh, I used to be in the automotive business when we couldn't find skilled mechanics. Instead of actually repairing a car, you just pull components out. You just replace the component, right? You just have a computer tell you it's broken. Put this in, and you you need less and less skill. Some you just you, you're just more of an executor than you are a diagnostic. So, uh, mm -hmm. so that's what I see right now. So I apologize for for ranting on about it. Uh, so. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, I, everyone today has given me so much to think about. We are um, coming up on time, but there is, I just like to close out with one more question. So when we think through the past three years, I'd like each of you to summarize what you see as the biggest opportunities and the biggest challenges for remodeling moving forward. So what are you optimistic about? What are you a little bit concerned about? Each of you could go in under 90 seconds. That would be amazing. So Ruthann, what do you think? Biggest opportunity, biggest challenge? Biggest opportunity is to change the moral compass on the condition of low income housing in America, flat out, um, to improve health and to advance climate as transformative uh, justice through low income communities leading the way on that. Biggest challenge is the capacity and jobs, but I think we need to think about this in terms of our trade and tech schools, and we need to recruit in low income communities for remodeling uh, of opportunities for careers. Excellent. Jessica, what about you? What are you most excited about? What are you most concerned about? Uh, concerns very well expressed by my co-panelists <clears throat> co today. Um, skilled labor and making sure we have continuity to get our hands on the right equipment, including service drops from utilities and so on. Um, I'm much more naturally inclined to optimism. Uh, I want to call out from the report, um, I took great encouragement from those increasing levels of home ownership among households of colors as foundational to wealth creation. Um, big picture, uh, fundamental change over the last three years in an industry-wide pivot in lean in to decarbonization and emissions reduction at federal, state, local level. The time to act is now and the policies are being put in place. Excellent. Keith, what about you? I'm bullish. I, I think the demographics are right. I think I think we're living in a do it for me world rather than a do it yourself world. Uh, probably some of the risks are the unintended consequences. And I'll, and, and I'll do a specific example of that. So so assuming that you believe in sort of the electrification and all that. But let me tell you one of the ramifications of electrification. All those coal plants get shut down. That's where all the synthetic gypsum comes for drywall. So now, now you're going to have an increase in the cost of drywall. So you, so you've got, you know, everything's intertwined here. So what happens is, as we drive to get more affordable, or, or some of our decisions are in, they're they're in conflict with each other. It's almost like the Federal Reserve wants full employment plus sta you know, st stable money. It's hard to do both. So as as we're doing these things, so my my biggest risk is my biggest concern is that we we try to implement something without understanding the, the long-term impact that it has down the road two or three or four years from now or, or and preparing for that. So, but for 23 and 24 and 25, I think, I think we're in a good place. I feel good. Excellent. Thank you, Keith. And finally, Carlos, what about you? Hey, so I'll start with the challenge. And I think I'm gonna, I, not to echo all what my panelists have said, I'm gonna throw a different kind of challenge. And that's really knowing which homes are most in need of repair or improvement and what kind of specific repair or improvement they need. 
Um, we, we're able to do this study every two years because of our colleagues at HUD and the census who provided the American Housing Survey and our colleagues at the DOE's um, information, um, Energy Information Administration who produced RECs, Residential Energy Consumer Survey. So this allows us to do this study to be able to help understand and to communicate to manufacturers, to suppliers and distributors and to modelers what to market and to who to market to, but also to help the program that Ruth Ann has mentioned, um, both the national programs as well as the municipal, local and charitable programs about who to target with what kind of intervention. So I'd say the data, um, even expanding on the data even further and supporting our data collection agencies um, is gonna be absolutely critical. On the opportunity, I have to echo Keith, you know, there will always be a need to improve our homes. Safe, decent, and affordable housing is a need that will never go away in this country. So, and this industry is critical um, to all of those financial and health outcomes that come with having that stability of housing. So I'd like to think that this pandemic gave us a chance to rethink how both how our homes work for us and what we need to get, um, what kind of performance uh, we actually want out of our out of our housing, including the existing housing. So I will paraphrase Keith and his colleague Mike Jost when I uh, at, at ABC when I say that I'm bullish. I'm bullish on American homes. Thank you, Carlos. This uh, report and this discussion has been absolutely illuminating. Uh, we definitely could go on for at least a couple more hours, um, but we're going to leave it here for today. The report now is publicly available on the Joint Center for Housing Studies website, along with a ton of data and interactive charts and tools. Thank you so much to Carlos, to Abby, all of our panelists, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for a great discussion. Thank you, Jane. Thank you.